morning, everybody. Stay awake in the darkness. <laughs> well, for our last Sunday School of the Year, I've put together a PowerPoint presentation of some things I'd like to share with you that I'm excited about. And we can put it up on the screen, Hayden, whenever you're ready. And I've entitled this PowerPoint, Testaments of Grace. And the subtitle, as you can read, is Reviving Voices from Past Pews. And so what this, what this presentation is going to be is going to be portions or excerpts from the last wills and testaments of people who attended the churches that we love. And this is a really, really interesting thing to do because it, gets, it gives us the opportunity to meet people from the 17th century, to meet not just the pastors of the churches that are kind of our heroes and those kinds of things, but the people that sat under their ministry. And so you can see in the picture in the background is the beginning of uh, the typical beginning of most every single will from that time in the name of God, amen, with a seal on the top. Uh, and they're, they're beautiful documents visually, but the, they're beautiful documents in terms of their content as well. And so I, I'd really like to share some of these with you. If we could just move to the next slide, Hayden. So what are my purposes in doing so? I want you to, as I just said, introduce you to the men and women pastored by our theological forefathers. What effect did their ministry have on the men and women in the pews? Uh, how were their lives affected? What kind of people were they pastoring? And I want to show how God's grace affected their lives and their perspectives, in particular as, as they set their final affairs in order. And you can see, well, l let's put it this way. You're going to read things, we are going to read things together that it is literally listening to their voice. They would tell the person, the scrivener, the will writer, what to write, and then the will writer writes it down, and then we read it back. <laughs> you're, you're hearing their voice. You're going to hear the very things that they said, which is a, a, just a really crazy thing to think about. Someone from 1679, for example, and they, they speak to a scrivener, the scrivener writes it down, we read what they wrote, their voice is alive again. We're hearing them speak, which is really amazing. And they say wonderful things about the grace of God. And you can see how it shaped and affected their lives based on the things that they said in their last wills and testaments. But you can also connect through these documents with their humanity and their reality. They're not just, oh, those picture-perfect people who said amazing things in their wills. You can also see the frustrations that they had and some of the difficulties that they faced and some of their doubts. And so it, it's really like meeting someone who would have sat right next to you in the pew in a church uh, so very long ago. And then, of course, I want to commend their example to you the perspectives that they had are worthy of imitation. They're worthy examples to be followed. Uh, they're really wonderful. They are indeed testaments of grace. Let's move to the next slide. Another of my purposes is to give us perspective because these are documents in preparation for death. Not all of them are written right before someone dies. Sometimes they're written many years in advance. But it's still a document designed to prepare you for the end of your life. And the, the scriptures say to us in Ecclesiastes 7, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of, the f of fools is in the house of mirth. And as Moses said in Psalm 90, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. And so I hope that, again, to repeat myself, that these give us a degree of perspective, that our days are numbered, and we ought to prepare ourselves for the end of our lives. And I'm not saying, so make your last wills and testaments. You'll see what I mean more so as we proceed through these documents. It's, it's a matter of how do I view the things I currently have? How do I view the way that I live my life now? That's the heart of wisdom is not so much what will I do on the last day of my life, but how shall I live from here until that point? Let's move to the next one and get our first example. So first we're going to meet Francis Miller, who was a cloth worker of London. He was born in 1620 and he signed his will on the 30th of September, 1686. And then it was proved or probated uh, four years later. So he, he died at some point before 6 March 1690. And Francis Miller was a member of Thomas Brooks Church. We know this because in his will, uh, he, he, he refers to the church and members from the church. But I first went 
I first knew to go looking for Francis Miller from someone else's will, who said, to the poor of the church of the said Mr. Thomas Brooks, five pounds, to be distributed by the said Mr. Brooks and Mr. Francis Miller. And if you're reading a will and someone leaves money to the church and they name the pastor and someone else to help with the distribution of it, that usually means that they're either another elder or they're an assistant to the pastor or they're a deacon. And so I'm assuming that Thomas, that Francis Miller was possibly a deacon of Thomas Brooks Church, and at, at the very least he was obviously a member. So this is someone who lived, at least for a, a time, under the ministry of Thomas Brooks and would have cooperated with Thomas Brooks in the uh, in the execution, in the, the carrying out of this person's bequest to give money to the poor of the church. So that's who Francis Miller is. He's from Thomas Brooks Church. Let's see what he said in his will. Let's hear his voice, someone who would have sat next to you in the pew, and now he speaks to you today. He says, Knowing that it is appointed for man once to die, nothing more certain and nothing more uncertain than when and where, And that the Lord commands King Hezekiah by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 33, verse 1, to set his house in order, for he must die. I, Francis Miller, merchant and cloth worker of the city of London, the second son of John Miller, clerk, born in Colchester in East Saxon in the year 1620, and through the Lord's great free favor and mercy to me yet in health, considering the frailty and uncertainty of this present life, and that I walk up and down at best but in a vain show, do therefore make this my present testament and last will. Next slide. First, and principally, I recommend my soul unto Almighty God, my Maker and Creator, believing for eternal life alone through the infinite riches of His grace, the death, merit, satisfaction, resurrection, and ascension of our dear Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, for my sin and iniquity, and that is my burden. Blessed be God for Jesus Christ, who went once for all with his own blood into the holy of holiest, and there by one offering, when he offered up himself, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified, satisfied divine justice, and brought in everlasting righteousness, in which I hope to be found in the morning of resurrection, who will change this vile body and make it like unto his glorious body. He that has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure." quoting from 1 John there, of course. So you can see how the grace of God has impacted his life and is changing his perspectives and is causing him to think carefully and yet joyfully about the end of his life. He commits his soul into the hand of God, trusting for salvation in Jesus Christ and awaiting the resurrection. Next. Now, we're skipping ahead towards the end of his will. And there was a long list, a long list of people that he left money to. And it seems that most of them were connected to the church or or friends and such things. So he he gave away many, many, many bequests. Uh, A lot of, not necessarily large quantities, but money to this person and that person. A long list. And he says this, Let not relations be troubled, I bequeath them no more. God can bless a little and blast a great deal. Blessed be the Lord for trusting me with so much. I have endeavored in my calling to keep a good conscience, both toward God and man, and I hope he will bless it to them. I have not labored alone for them, but for the distressed members of Jesus Christ. He might have put them in my condition and me in theirs, all of grace, grace, free grace. And so he's, he's speaking to his family and saying, don't be, don't be frustrated that I did not give you the, the fullness of my estate. Do not be frustrated that I gave so much to so many people because don't think that if you've amassed a great amount, it's always going to last or that a little can go, cannot go far at all. He says the Lord can bless a little and blast a great deal. That's the perspective of someone at the end of their life who's or, or nearing it or preparing for it who has seen the way that things can go up and down throughout life and they're saying don't, don't make your life all about how much money you have, my children. Don't think that that is the source of your happiness and what will carry you through. Rather, he speaks of grace, grace, free grace. Moving on to John Tompkins, brewer of Wapping. Yep, I'm just looking behind me because there was a little bit of a mess up with the PowerPoint when it went to the Mac, the Apple computer, so... That's why I keep looking over my shoulder to make sure we're looking at the same thing. So John Tompkins was a brewer of Wapping that's in London, or just outside of it, where Hercules Collins lived. 
And he signed his will 24 September 1737, and it was proved just a couple of years later. I'm giving you those dates so that you can see how close this person's thoughts were to the actual end of their life. Now, there's no guarantee that when you sign your will, there's X amount of days left for you after that. The point is simply that these are words near the end of the life of these persons. And John Tompkins was buried in Bunhill Fields, where so many of our Baptist, Pado Baptist uh, forefathers were buried, the dissenters' burial ground in London. And he was related to Petty France members and Joseph Masters, who was also a particular Baptist pastor. So this person was not, to my knowledge, in a particular Baptist church, but was well known to particular Baptists, was a friend and a family member of them. Next slide. And here you can see some of the, not necessarily frustration, but some of the obstacles that, that people faced, as we do today. I, John Tompkins, brewer and citizen of London, having sustained diverse great losses and disappointments in the course of trade and especially by the unfaithfulness and falsehood of deceitful and fraudulent servants, am disabled from showing such tokens of my affection and kindness to my children as I designed, which hath been a great affliction and grief of mind to me. But yet, I desire to submit to the disposing providence of the all-wise God and quietly to acquiesce in his will humbly depending on him that he may be pleased to give to my children according to the request of good old Jacob, bread to eat and raiment to put on together with his blessing and gracious presence. So John Tompkins says, I wish, I I sincerely desire that I could have given more to my children, but I can't. And he accepts that and he asks God to bless his children and to provide for them in light of the fact that he cannot provide for them in the way that he had wanted to do so. You can understand how he feels. I mean, when the economy crashed in 2008, there were many people whose entire portfolios and all of their investments and everything, it was gone in a moment. It it happened so quickly. John Tompkins says, well, this happened because of bad servants, (laughs) deceitful and fraudulent servants who have caused great losses and disappointments. Next, Maurice and Bridget King or Morris and Bridget King. And now I have them together because Maurice wrote his will first, and then his wife, her will, actually copies this same portion from his will. And so they both said these words. He said it first, and Bridget copied him after that. These were longtime members of William Kiffin's church. Uh, Maurice, often spelled Morris, assisted William Kiffin. I don't know if he was ever a pastor, but he was in the church for a very long time, from the 1670s, all the way to 1717. So a longtime pastor of William Kiffin's church and an assistant and helper to Kiffin himself. And in their will, they want to be buried near where several of their children were were buried. Why or when? Until our Lord Jesus Christ shall come, who shall change this vile body and make it like unto his glorious body, committing my soul into the arms of the God of mercy, who will save them with an everlasting salvation that put their trust in him, whom I have believed and have good hope through grace that I shall see his salvation through the alone merits of Jesus Christ, my Savior and Redeemer, unto whom be glory now and forever and ever. Amen. It's such a wonderful, wonderful thing to see the confidence, the confident hope and trust with which the people of God commit their souls into the hands of their Savior, committing my soul into the arms of the God of mercy. And and when he says, have good hope through grace, remember that's not the hope of, well, I hope so, but a confident, expectant, assured hope that he shall see his salvation through the alone merits of Jesus Christ. And Bridget, she agreed. She said the same thing. She copied the words of her husband's will into her own will. And I commend their example to you. Let's move on to the next one, Anna Howard. Now, this is the longest one that I'm going to read to you. So it's kind of the, 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 prize, the prize of the collection for this morning. Anna Howard, she was a widow. She signed her will in 23 of June, 1679. It was proved uh, a month later. So these words are, are very close to her death. And she likely was, was unwell or, or aware of the fact that her death was not far away. She left five pounds to the poor of Mr. Wilcox's church and five pounds to Mr. Wilcox. It was very, very common practice for people in their wills to leave money to the poor of the church and to leave money oftentimes to the pastors of the church. 
and for needs such as that. Thomas Wilcox was a particular Baptist. He died in 1687. And so this is a particular Baptist in a particular Baptist church. And one of the great things about last wills and testaments is that you get to hear the voices of the women of the church. If you just read the theological literature of the particular Baptists, generally speaking, you'll get the, the, the slightest of whispers of the, of the women of the church, whereas here, Anna Howard's going to speak the most to us of any of, any of the uh, wills that we're going to read today. And so you get to meet the ladies of the church. You get to meet the women of the church when you read their wills. And that's one of the reasons that I really find this kind of work or research very rewarding is getting to meet people. And it's especially important. I think it's especially significant for Baptists because we believe in congregationalism, that the people participate in the discipline of the church and the ordination of officers, et cetera. And so who were the who were the people of the congregation? It's not just the pastors that matter in Baptist ecclesiology. It's all it's just as much the people in the pew. And so, if if a church book says the brethren read and considered the confession and it was published, who are those brethren? You, you'd never know them unless you read things like this and say, "Hey, now I know Anna Howard, and she was a really special lady because, boy, her her will is really interesting." So we're going to read three sections, uh, three slides, and this is. Just pretty, you can hear her voice so very clearly. All right, let's read. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, three persons and one God, to whom all honor and glory now and forevermore, amen. The Son of my life is past his meridian. Now, meridian would be the the noon, the high point, a.m., anti-meridian, p.m., post-meridian, before noon, afternoon. So the sun of my life, it's past its zenith. I'm past the, the high point. The sun of my life is past his meridian, and being now in the afternoon of my age, find the night of nature coming on fast upon me, and expect the dissolution of this earthly tabernacle as appears. And although I have or heretofore found little leisure for matters of greatest moment, she hasn't dedicated much time to things that are really important, for which I am ashamed and heartily sorry. Yet, to the intent, through God's assistant grace, that my contemplations of another world may hereafter be the more free, and the distractions for matters of this world the fewer, not knowing how suddenly, but certainly, grim death with his ghostly countenance shall appear to all flesh. Therefore, I, Anne Howard of the parish of St. Mary Newington in the county of Surrey, widow, well knowing, that an uncertain provision suits not with a certain danger, have made a disposition of that estate the Lord in mercy hath been pleased to bestow upon me in this transitory life, and by this last will and testament do order and dispose of the same in manner and form following. Now you can already see that she's a pretty good writer, isn't she? She's very eloquent. And just to, to clarify something that may not be very clear, she says the She's doing this that her contemplations of another world may hereafter be the more free and the distractions for matters of this world the fewer. In other words, if you have an estate that you have not prepared to dispose, then you're going to have thoughts of, wait, 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 no, no, not yet, not yet, not yet, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. And so you're not ready to die. You know, I, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't got everything ready. And she's saying, in order to be able to contemplate my end with a greater peace and in order to have a more... Um, blessed meditation of the same, less distractions from this world, a, a greater focus on the world to come. Therefore, I'm going to set my affairs in order through this last will and testament. Next, she says, but first and above all things, I do remember all humble and hearty thanks unto Almighty God for all his manifold and gracious mercies and blessings most undeservedly bestowed upon me, humbly confessing and acknowledging that I have not been worthy of the least of all thy blessings, for I have so run the ragged race of my sinful life in the wilderness of this wicked world, she loves alliteration, committing so many and grievous sins that I have stark left either number more or place for worse. Yet I humbly beseech Almighty God of his infinite goodness and mercy not to look upon the frailty of my youth, the folly of my riper years, nor the iniquity of my whole, For folly and sin have had their seat in my mind and left their footsteps in all my actions. But to look upon the work of his own hands, the multitude of his own mercies, the merits, precious death, and passion of Jesus Christ, the righteous, his Son, my only Savior and Redeemer, 
who died for my sins with his precious blood to wash my sinful soul clean from all my transgressions and to clothe me with his righteousness. When she looks back upon her life and her youth and her riper years and the whole, her entire life, what she sees is sin, imperfection, disobedience. And she says, don't look upon what I have done, O Lord. Look upon what you have done in me by your son, Jesus Christ the work of your hands. Next. And I further beseech his divine majesty that as long as this mortal, not moral, but mortal life shall last, I may so set before me the day of my departure that the proportion of death may never hinder my preparation to die. And when his good will and pleasure shall be to separate my sinful soul from the fetters of my flesh, that then, although the numberless number of my heinous sins and transgressions deserve eternal damnation, Yet, by the infinite mercies and endless merits of Jesus Christ, my only Savior, I may be pardoned and freely acquitted of all my transgressions and appear righteous in his sight, so that my soul, into whose sacred hands I commend the same, may be by him received into his glorious kingdom, the heaven and heavens of happiness, there to remain with his elect forever. Amen. Good job, Anna. Well done. But we give all glory and praise to God because it's his grace, as she says, working in her life. The numberless number of my heinous sins and transgressions deserve eternal damnation. Yet by the infinite mercies and endless merits of Jesus Christ, my only Savior, I will be pardoned and freely acquitted of all my transgressions. That is a wonderful, wonderful testament of grace. Next, Mr. Banks, a frustrated father. Listen to this. And I told you you're going to meet the humanity of these people. I give and bequeath unto my daughter Mary Banks the sum of five pounds of lawful money of England and no more. Why, Mr. Banks? For that she, by her willful disobedience and undutiful carriage behavior, hath several ways offended me, and by her wicked behavior hath been the chief occasion of my present sickness and thereby almost brought me to my grave. That's recorded for all time. In your last will and testament, Mr. Banks, Mary must have been quite a handful. And then, what's next? I give and bequeath unto my loving daughter, Grace Banks, the sum of 500 pounds of lawful money of England. I'm sure that Mary and Grace did not get along very well after this, but it's there. And William Banks, whether he's right or not, I'm not going to necessarily say he's right, he says, Mary's almost brought me to my grave. And my present sickness, she has been the chief occasion of my present sickness. Now, we know that stress reduces the immune system. And so you can understand, yeah, Mary probably did nearly cause the death of her father in his present sickness. And Grace, however, receives plenty of money. 500 pounds in 1678 will go very well. Now, here's a little side bit. When you read or watch Pride and Prejudice or Sense and Sensibility in those books, you you find that in those books so many times... A chunk of the plot or one of the key plot points is how estates were to be disposed and how, well, if, if she marries with the consent of her mother, she shall inherit the estate. If she does not marry with the consent of her mother, she, she gets nothing. And so will she choose her love though she receives no money or, you know, and all those kinds of things? That's normal. That's not, uh, that's not Jane Austen coming up with some clever plot device. That's normal life in England. And you can see things like this. Many will say things like, on the, age of, at the, on the day of her marriage, she shall receive so much, supposing that she marries with the consent of her mother or guardian, such things. And so you can see here how William Banks really prepares grace for a, a, well, a well-taken-care-of life, but Mary does not receive the same amount. Next, James Graves, a relatable father. For I don't think that we can relate too much to the previous one. I don't have daughters, so I can't relate to it. But we can relate... Every single parent here can relate to this one, something that James Graves had written in his last will and testament. He said, I beseech the Lord to give all my children saving grace that I may joyfully meet them hereafter in glory. (laughs) It almost makes you cry just reading it. It's the the prayer of every parent, isn't it? Just such a, a wonderful, wonderful thing to say. Next, John Humphreys. Now, this is, this is a sobering one. 
It's a very honest thing for this person to say, but it's very sobering. John Humphreys, someone who shows doubt without confidence, he says, being in good health of body, mind, and memory, because you, you have to declare that you are in a disposing state. You have to declare that as your will is being written, you're in a, a state of mind and health sufficient to be able to make these decisions. That's why they say things like being in good health of, bi- of body, mind, and memory. So he goes on, and not knowing how it may please God to deal with me at the time of my decease, but considering the uncertainty of this present transitory life, therefore do make my last will and testament, etc., so what is he saying? He's saying, I'm healthy right now, but I'm, I know that I'm not going to be healthy forever. I'm going to die someday. But he acknowledges, he says, I, when I die, I don't know how God will deal with me. I don't know what, what's going to happen at that point. And that's, that's a very honest thing for John Humphreys to have said in his will. And it's, it's stuck with me. When I read all these wills, many, 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 I keep excerpts of the, the highlights from them, and these are many of the highlights. That's where this is coming from. And I read that, and it, it kind of punched me in the gut a little bit, like, man, John, you don't, it doesn't have to be like this. You know, you can have confidence. There, there is an answer to your, to your doubt, but I don't know what the rest of the story was for him. John Humphreys. Next, Thomas Chair, with confidence and doubt. A much more relatable example, I think. Thomas says this, I humbly recommend my soul to that great God from whom I had it, beseeching him to receive it into his bosom for the merits of his son, the Savior of sinners, amongst whom I am one of the greatest, and my body to the earth from whence it came in hopes of a happy resurrection. O Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. O Lord, I repent. Pardon the weakness of my repentance. Thomas Chair needs to meet uh, John Humphreys and say, yes, yes, our faith is not perfect. Yes, our faith rises and falls, but trust and repent. I really like that one from Thomas Chair. I think I've quoted it in at least one sermon to you before, if you recall. Next, John Yates. Uh, He was a clerk, which is another way of saying minister most of the time. Uh, He signed his will in March of 1678, and he died in August 1679, so once again, This is close to the end of his life. His will was proved in September. Uh, His wife, Anne, uh, and relatives, the Dashwoods, were members of the Petty France Church. So his wife ended up being a a member of Nehemiah Cox and William Collins Church. The Dashwoods were members of the Petty France Church. Uh, The Yates were friends of the Kiffins. So these, John Yates, I do not believe, was actually a particular Baptist. I think he was an independent, but was in the circles of the particular Baptist, and his wife and his relatives were in particular Baptist churches when he, in his will, he left his interlinear Hebrew, Greek, and Latin Bible to Joseph Masters, already mentioned in a previous will, a particular Baptist pastor. It's really cool when you read things like that because you know how someone, how someone got their books or what kind of books that they had. Joseph Masters was educated at Oxford, but he was not allowed to graduate because he was a nonconformist. So he would have had the education to use and appreciate a Hebrew, Greek, and Latin Bible. So John Yates, oh, by the way, so we already mentioned Jane Austen. See the Dashwoods here? The Dashwoods at the Petty France Church, William Dashwood, his brother, Francis Dashwood. If you follow the Francis Dashwood line a couple generations, you get the family that was the inspiration for Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility Dashwood family. Not joking, I can prove it to you from a, a journal article. So this name Dashwood here from the Petty France Church are direct relatives of the family that inspired Jane Austen to write Sense and Sensibility and to use the name Dashwoods in Sense and Sensibility. Pretty cool, huh? (laughs) Don't laugh too loud. (laughs) All right, what does John Yates say as we bring our study near a conclusion? And this is a minister. I said that it would mostly be the pew people, the voices from the pew. Here is a minister. He says, to conclude, this is the end of his will. My will and desire is my friends and relations should neither be clothed with mourning habits nor too long mourning hearts for my departure. I have outlived 14 lusters of years. Who amongst 10,000 in the world arrives to my age of 74? Should more years be added to me, what might it be but length of years added to heaps of sins and sorrows? All praise to Jehovah my life and length of days. My faith is fixed upon the rock of ages, Jesus Christ, who hath by his atonement fully satisfied the law and justice of God for me, and is set down at the right hand of his Father, continually making intercession 
for me. John Yates says, Outwardly and inwardly, don't mourn me too long. A mourning habit is to don't dress in mourning for too long. Do not have a mourning heart for too long. Outwardly and inwardly, don't mourn too long for me. I've had a long and a good life by God's grace, and I will live forever through the grace and merits of my Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, if you think about what he's saying, and this is why I'm commending their example to you, he's saying this, this death is just a transition into glory. Don't think of me as ending and, the, and he's gone. But rather, yes, you will miss me. I will not be here with you on the earth, but we will meet in glory hereafter, and I will, I will be experiencing a bliss that you cannot possibly fathom. So if you keep mourning and mourning and mourning, it, it doesn't match. It doesn't match the fact that I am in glory now, and I have lived such a blessed life in God's grace. And that's, that's a healthy perspective. He's not saying do not mourn at all. He's just saying, let it be proportional to what we believe, to what is actually true. Let it be proportional to the fact that I am entering into blessedness. And another way of expressing this is many of the last wills talk about, I am awaiting my change, or I look forward to my change, or I commit my soul into the hands of my heavenly father, uh, expecting my change. They speak of death as a change, because it, it is not uh, you know a, an end it is not hitting a wall and, and stopping it is transforming it is changing and I, th- I think that that is a, a helpful perspective and a good way of thinking about death a very Christian way of thinking about our death and if we use that vocabulary more I think it would give us all a more healthy perspective of such things if we speak of our change and expecting our change etc next conclusions the scriptures tell us in 1 Timothy 6, 6-8, to But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So we, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? These wills, I believe, show God's grace in their lives to have arrived at this kind of godliness with contentment, with a life free from love of money. They, many of them had a good, a good amount of resources. They weren't monks. They had not taken vows of poverty. But they did not love their money so much that they were connected to it. In fact, they specifically said, I want to dispose of this or prepare it for disposal so that I can more, more freely meditate on the life to come. And they encouraged their relations as well, their family members and friends, not to love the money, not to love the resources, not to love the estate, but to love the Lord who gives eternal life. Last slide. Well, second to last, actually. Conclusions. I hope, brothers and sisters, that these testaments of grace cause us to meditate on questions like this. What is our hope and comfort in life and death? Well, it should be what they said their hope and comfort was, the, the endless merits of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Savior of sinners. Because the life that we are given now is a life that will last eternally, in greater glory and bliss after our death. What is our hope and comfort in life and death? And if you want a great answer to that question, just read question and answer one of an Orthodox catechism or the Heidelberg Catechism, which asks and answers that very question. What is our only comfort in life and death? Secondly, have we considered the number of our days and obtained a heart of wisdom? Psalm 90 says that we ought to do this. It asks God to teach us to do this. Teach us to number our days, O Lord, that we might get a heart of wisdom. Have we thought about this? That one day our lives will end too. Our change will one day, the day of our change will one day arrive. The the hairs of our head are numbered as are our days. Have we considered this? And has it changed the way that we think and act? Have we gotten a heart of wisdom as a result? Thirdly, do the possessions God has given us impede our communion with him now and our preparation for life hereafter? I've got to get this job. I've got to work overtime. I've got to work, 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 work. 
and so I can't be in the Lord's house. Those kinds of things. Or where I move and, ha- and the job that I do and the money that I'm trying to get, all these things, is that what is controlling all the decisions in your life? You see, they're just possessions. And they can impede your communion with God now because you're so focused on, on the things of this life. And then they can impede your preparation for life hereafter. But wait, I'm not ready yet. But wait, I need to get this much. But wait, I need to, to have things arranged in such and such a way. All of those things are distracting you from glorifying God now and awaiting the glory of God hereafter. Think about your possessions and the value that you attribute to them, the the dedication and effort that you give to them. They're just possessions. We just read from the scriptures what you have in this world you cannot take out with you. And so I ask you to consider what what is our legacy? What is your legacy? If someone was reading about us in 100, 200, 300, 400 years, and they did research on our church, and they they found your names in a membership list, and they started to look you up and all these things, what would your legacy be? What kind of person were you? What What kind of behavior did you leave behind? What fruit has the ministry that we have sat under all these years produced in us? To what extent have we improved on God's goodness and kindness to us? Are we testaments of grace? These are are valuable and profitable questions for us to ask ourselves. And reading all of these wills, so many, many, many wills, has has made me very conscious of this very kind of question. If someone summarizes my life in a sentence in, in 100 and 200 years and says, this is the kind of person that Sam was, or this is the kind of, of teaching or, or preaching that, that he had, this is the characteristic of it, would it be something like these testaments of grace where it's giving glory to God and all praise to Jesus Christ and offering salvation to sinners freely through the gospel? Or is it, well, he was an, an ornery person or he, he was always bumping heads with people or, you know, it, it changes your perspective. It makes you think, why, why would I cause conflict with my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ why would I be so trivial as to, to argue with a sister or a brother? Why, why would I be so selfish as to act in such and such a way when we're brothers and sisters in Christ headed to glory and I want to serve them and I want to, to love them and if they offend me, I'm not going to get so upset about it because it's, it's not that big a deal. This, this kind of thing puts our actions and our relationships in perspective and you, you want your legacy to be that you see yourself as a sinner and you see Jesus Christ as a savior and you love the Lord and you love the people of the Lord and you're willing to, well, in the case of these persons, they, their wills show that. They gave, they gave, this is not an appeal for you to give money, but they gave money to the pastor and to the poor of the church. They showed that they cared for the church and, and their lives are indeed testaments of grace. So this is my encouragement to you to follow their example in their faith and to follow their example in their life, and to follow their example as they prepared for death. Next slide. And there's the conclusion of Testaments of Grace. Well, I hope that that's been beneficial to you. Uh, Examples of God's grace in their lives for us to imitate and follow by God's grace as well. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, We have seen so many examples today of how we ought to number our days. And so we pray that you would indeed give us hearts of wisdom, that we might consider our ways, our decisions, the things that we have by your grace. We pray that all of these things, that our perspective about them might be transformed, that we might love the world less and love you more, love your people more, love ourselves less. We pray that the talents and the resources that you have given to us might be improved for your glory and for the good of your people. Our Father in heaven, how we thank you for these testaments of grace. We, we see them and we relate to them in so many ways. And we thank you above all that your son Jesus Christ has removed the curse of death, has freed us from all our sins, has granted us eternal life, and that we do indeed await a change. We do indeed await a happy resurrection on that glorious morning. O oh Lord, how we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your grace in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, in the blood of Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. <clears throat>